Benvenuti all'Istituto Italiano di Cultura. Welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles for the opening of Gianfranco Ferré, Design Principles. Uh, too far and are not from the area, are not planning uh, any trips to LA anytime soon. I hope uh, that uh, uh, the presentation will give you at least a flavor of uh, what we have uh, uh, on display and most importantly of the great genius that was Gianfranco Ferré. Gianfranco Ferré Design Principles is a project realized by the School of Design at the Politecnico in Milan in Italy and the Gianfranco Ferré Research Center in collaboration with our Cultural Institute. The display consists in 10 of Ferré's most iconic signature white shirts. Uh, we have with us tonight the curators of the show, Paolo Bertola, who is Professor of Design at the Politecnico di Milano, and uh, Rita Raghi, who is uh, uh, the director of the former uh, Gianfranco Ferré Foundation and uh, senior advisor of the now Gianfranco Ferré Research Center. I really would like to warmly uh, thank them for uh, dedicating so much uh, attention and care uh, to this uh, project. And I also would like today's opportunity to thank uh, all their team and all my team uh, here in Los Angeles who made this event possible. This uh, exhibit has been uh, in the works for uh, a good one year and a half now, almost uh, uh, two years. And uh, you will notice uh, the extent of the project uh, during the panel and uh, also by reading uh, the catalog and uh, information materials that uh, complement the uh, exhibition. Although uh, I've been looking at these uh, pieces uh, uh, many times now, I have to say that today when I saw uh, the exhibit uh, uh, finished on display, uh, I realized uh, once uh, more uh, how uh, incredible uh, the genius uh, of Gianfranco Ferré uh, was how those uh, garments uh, that are uh, that were made uh, some 20, some 30, some 40 uh, years ago uh, are still very uh, current and uh, modern. It's really a timeless uh, uh, elegance. And uh, uh, the links between what he created back in the days and how it's still uh, relevant uh, for fashion practices nowadays is gonna be uh, the theme of uh, uh, this panel tonight, which is going to be moderated by Professor uh, Bertola. And uh, as you know, here uh, at the Italian Cultural Institute, we always uh, like to link uh, the Italian part to the local uh, counterpart. And so I am uh, really, really uh, grateful to our uh, local uh, panelists, uh, in particular, Denita Sewell, who is a professor at the Arizona State University uh, Herbert Institute for Design in the Arts. Uh, she traveled all the way from Phoenix to be uh, with us tonight. And also I'm uh, deeply grateful to David Paul and Nick Berrios, who are fashion designers uh, themselves, and also the co-chairs of the Department of Fashion Design at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in Los Angeles. They were extremely kind and committed to participating uh, to this program. So let me say grazie mille. In fact, uh, um, I was, and together with the curator, particularly keen on uh, having uh, um, a panel discussion tonight for the opening of uh, this exhibit because uh, Gianfranco Ferré was a teacher uh, himself, as uh, as you talked about uh, during the during the conversation, and he dedicated uh, uh, much of his time uh, to shape and advise uh, students. Uh, so, uh, having uh, uh, panelists that are uh, uh, part of the academic world really makes uh, uh, things uh, come sort of uh, uh, full uh, for circle tonight. Uh, now, before we start uh, our program, I would like to uh, invite uh, to the podium uh, our Consul General, Silvia Chiave, for uh, her, uh, her welcome remarks. Uh, but uh, while doing this, um, let me add, if you don't mind, and if you, Silvia, don't mind, uh, a personal uh, note. Because uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, the last time 
that I invite to this podium uh, our Consul General before she embarks uh, on, her, uh, uh, on the next professional chapter uh, of her life. She is uh, moving back to our uh, headquarters in Rome after having served uh, for four years uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, I have to say I had the privilege of working uh, with uh, Silvia Cave for only one year, but this one year was filled uh, with so many programs, events. Uh, we shared so much. I learned from her uh, so much. And uh, I'm really grateful for, the, uh, for having had the opportunity uh, to work alongside uh, such an inspiring uh, leader. And I have to say that uh, um, during uh, this year, I also uh, noticed uh, uh, that uh, she really left uh, a mark in our community. Uh, everyone here in Los Angeles I spoke to, and I include myself here, um, really admires her uh, a lot and uh, has been touched by her presence. So um, please give uh, a warm applause for Silvia Chiave, Consul General of Italy in Los Angeles. Well, what to say, thank you. Grazie, Emanuele. Uh, yesterday, Emanuele called me and asked me, do you mind if I say a brief goodbye to you or will you get emotional? Will you cry? And I said, I, I would love you to say goodbye. I cannot guarantee I will not get emotional. And since I'm getting emotional, I will uh, not turn this into my farewell and I will go uh, back to, to the event. But really, thank you. It was my privilege as well to work with you. It's been a, a great journey. So, uh, thank you all for being here. Grazie a tutti, benvenuti. Uh, I also wish to warmly thank our guests and speaker. I will not introduce them all because Emanuele did it. Thank you to Paola Bertola, Rita Iraghi, Denita Sewell, David Paul, and Nick Ferreos. Thank you very much for uh, doing this project with us. Tonight we're celebrating Gianfranco Ferre and his genius uh, that so well explored already uh, in the speech of our director, Emanuele Amendola. Uh, and, but I would also like to spend a few words uh, to another a great example of the Italian excellence, with, which is Il Politecnico di Milano, uh, that curated this exhibition project in collaboration with the Cultural Institute. Um, founded in 1863, Politecnico is amongst, is, is amongst best uh, centers for Italy's uh, higher education. In fact, uh, for eight years in a row, Politecnico has been recognized uh, amongst the top universities in Italy and really uh, amongst also, also the most outstanding universities in, in Europe. Um, and uh, uh, I am uh, from Milano, I'm a proud Milanese, and so uh, it is my pride to say that this college has always been thinking forward and thinking ahead. Um, also another note that uh, makes me happy and proud is that uh, starting last January, Politecnico di Milano has uh, appointed a new uh, rector, Donatella Asciutto, whom is the first woman to lead this important institution. So we're very proud of this. Uh, so we wish uh, Professor Shuto uh, the best for her tenure and we also hope that she will uh, uh, have the occasion to come uh, and visit, uh, to find time in her busy schedule to visit this beautiful exhibition. Uh, so Milan, Milano is the capital for many things. It's mostly renowned uh, for, for the general audience for design and fashion, for being the capital in Italy of design and fashion, together with of course, visual arts, culture, uh, opera, cuisine, and many other things, and design. Fashion is one of the aspects that makes us so loved uh, all over the world as Italians. Uh, from an economic point of view in Italy, uh, fashion business involves more than 60,000 large and medium and small enterprises. So it's the second sector in the nation for number of employees. And 2022 was, by the way, a very good uh, record year in Italy for uh, Italian fashion and economic results and uh, it showed also 
a great a recovery uh, from, uh, from the, the pandemic and COVID with a, a general revenue that was up 16% from 2021. So these are unprecedented results that uh, uh, represent one of the biggest growth achieved in Italian fashion business in the last two decades, uh, confirming the importance of made in Italy at the global level and of Milan as a capital of, of culture. So, Besides uh, numbers, uh, of course, uh, today the contribution of Italy, uh, of Italian fashion, uh, is not is not only economic. We cannot stop in numbers. Uh, all our prêt-à-porter, our haute couture, uh, Italian collection, Italian designers that become historical in some ways, like, like you will be able to witness uh, with this exhibition and this panel, continue to influence and inspire uh, really uh, the, entire, the entire world. Uh, and uh, since uh, already some decades, uh, Italy, uh, the, the Italian fashion, uh, Italian fashion has become synonymous, like in all other sectors, I must say, with high quality. All we produce is of the highest uh, quality. Uh, and our garments have become global icons. Uh, so, um, of course, as, as uh, Emanuele said, our designers always uh, can put together uh, as, as in many other sectors, but our fashion designers uh, specifically are able to put together our tradition in craftsmanship uh, uh, with, with the highest level of innovation and, and research. And this is exactly what Gianfranco Ferre did, and I'm sure that our speakers tonight will be able to testify further on this. So now, uh, without further ado, I'm very honored to invite to the podium to introduce the exhibit of this panel, Mrs. Rita Iraghi, steer advisor of the Gianfranco Ferre Research Center. Have a nice, um, a nice evening, and goodbye. Good evening and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm very proud to be here in Los Angeles at the Italian uh, Center, Cultural Center, and uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, really uh, emotion. I have big emotion because uh, uh, it's the first uh, exhibit that we gave uh, in the new version of the Gianfranco Ferre Research Center because uh, as uh, um, Mr. Amendola said before, um, I was the founder and the director of the Fondazione Gianfranco Ferre, who became now uh, Gianfranco Ferre a Research Center because the family Ferre made the donation of the entire archives and uh, headquarters to the Polytechnic of Milano. And so what you will see in the exhibit Gianfranco Ferre principal is a very small portion of uh, the archives. Uh, the archives uh, uh, has now more than 150,000 uh, items, uh, being uh, sketches, uh, uh, pictures, uh, press release, uh, magazine, uh, movies, plus uh, more or less more than uh, 3,000 uh, pieces of uh, garments uh, between uh, uh, items and accessories, and uh, is an entire patrimony that uh, we collect, uh, Gianfranco Ferre collect for years and years, and then the Foundation organized and managed, because uh, the archives for Ferre too had a very special uh, uh, means. And in fact, I'm, uh, uh, I prefer to, to use the word of uh, uh, Gianfranco, the quote of Mr. Ferre, who said, uh, I have no use for nostalgia. It, it could be far from my way of being and creating. In my view, an archive is a never-ending story directed toward to tomorrow. As for my own archive, it's also an accumulation of experience that serve me in moving forward, in continuing to invent and to improve at the, all the more. It is remembrance for the future. So that uh, really uh, uh, 
uh, emotion uh, movement that, that come from the uh, what you will see in the in the um, exhibit because uh, sketches and uh, a white blouse of the icon of Mr. Ferret are still uh, working now for the young people uh, thanks to uh, the processes that the, the Polytechnic of Milano will do in the, for the next future, continuing what we did in the last year as a foundation. And so hoping that you enjoy the exhibition now, uh, I will call on the podium Paola Bertola, who is the uh, scientific director of the Cent Center, Gianfranco Ferre Center Research, and uh, I don't remember the name, uh, Denita Schul, Nick Verrios, uh, and David Paul. Please, on the stage. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm also quite emotional in starting this uh, conversation, not only because this is the first exhibition, as uh, Rita Iradi said, uh, after uh, the archive and the foundation were donated to Politecnico, but also because I have a very distinguished guest to discuss uh, uh, about Gianfranco Ferré and uh, the exhibition. First of all, let me thank, uh, of course, the Italian Cultural Institute uh, to work with us uh, very closely on this project uh, and also to the General Consul for welcoming us so warmly and, warmly and for the nice word about Politecnico. Uh, so, uh, I'm uh, uh, very proud to introduce you, uh, as I said, three uh, distinguished guests. Uh, I will uh, put you some uh, questions uh, to deepen uh, the identity of Gianfranco Ferré and uh, introduce some of the concepts that you will find in the exhibition. And uh, I will start from uh, Denita. Thanks for, for joining us, uh, as uh, you were uh, somehow uh, the first one to bring uh, an exhibition about Gianfranco Ferré in, uh, in the US, in Phoenix, some years ago. So you can tell why you selected uh, precisely Gianfranco Ferré for uh, linking him to the uh, American culture and to introduce him to uh, the US. Um. What I feel I can offer to this conversation um, is a case study or an example of the impact that a single exhibition can have beyond the time that it's on view, a long lasting impact. So I was curator of fashion at Phoenix Art Museum. I was at a conference in Florence I met Alessandra Boiza, and she uh, was a warm uh, colleague at the conference. She was talking about the exhibition that she had been involved in, and she kindly introduced me to Rita Aragi. And with their generosity of spirit, um, we embarked on bringing the exhibition to Phoenix Art Museum in 2015. There is a saying that if you leave something behind, it will ensure that you see that person again. And I feel like this is what the exhibition did. It left an impression, the white shirts on the, on the community, on the school that I'm now part of, Arizona State University, and on me personally. So, um, next. Um, the exhibition was first shown at the Prato Textile Museum in a 19th century former uh, textile factory in 2014. And this ingenious method of hanging the, um, the mannequins from the ceiling put the shirts and the, and the fashions into a sculptural realm. And then it was shown in Milan at the Royal Palace in 2015 in an 18th century environment. Um, these precious walls could not withstand hanging anything, so this framework was built 
And then when it came to Phoenix, um, it was put in this very modern building, which had been uh, completed just in 2006, the entrance, the gallery. And it's an um, 11,000 square foot gallery. You see the floor plan here. And, and at this uh, institution, the architecture allowed us to enter on the center point. And um, the first time that I took patrons to the exhibition, uh, first of all, there I was asking the director, I went back to Phoenix from Florence and I asked the director, I want to show 27 white shirts in our 11,000 square foot gallery. <laughs> and it's normally devoted to the big, uh, you know, Monet or whatever big painting or general audience exhibition. And so it was, it was a leap of faith on his part that I applaud him for. Um, but when I took the first group of patrons in, you can, um, I was nervous. I was like, I'm either going to be laughed out of town or they're going to be impressed. And their jaws dropped. And that was the reaction from uh, the whole time. People were so impressed with the magnificence that it, of the installation that it transformed their view of fashion, let alone the white shirt. So um, a talented group of people came to install the show. And again, all of them embodied this Italian generosity of spirit. They became lifelong warm friends that I've continued to um, see when I go to Italy. And um, my husband is now on a mission to move there. So this is the impact an exhibition can have. Uh, this exhibition and the shirts, what Ferre created, embody not only the generosity of spirit in, in the, his, uh, these colleagues, but craftsmanship, design culture, and innovation in materials. It is widely regarded as the best show that Phoenix Art Museum ever had. It fostered a community around it of people who then like found each other, uh, people with similar values around design came together um, with the purpose of seeing this show and appreciating it. It showed fashion as an installation, fashion as design, with a view of art, sculpture, and cultural importance. And I believe that the exhibition here at the Institute, in advance, um, the uh, exhibition here at the Institute will also have this same impact. These are, on the right, is a slide of the advertisements from the show. Uh, at Phoenix Art Museum, and on the left is an advertisement for work that is done by my student and uh, at the school, Arizona State University. And I think you can see very clearly here that this student, um, although they didn't see the show, the imagery is still around. The books are around the studio. Next slide. And then um, it influenced our curriculum for the level one fashion construction class, they're all required to make a white shirt. <laughs> and they were on view here in the Scottsdale Fashion Square. There's one more slide. And they really embrace and it focuses them. Um, instead of going wild at the fabric store and coming up with crazy things, it focuses them immediately on a classic so that they can then discover their own creativity in depth. Thank you very much, Sunit. I think that your words... Uh... <laughs> are already giving a little bit of taste uh, of what will uh, come. And uh, I'm happy also to 
uh, ask uh, Nick Various uh, uh, about this connection that you've been experienced between uh, uh, Italian fashion and uh, the North American culture. Along the history of fashion, there were many times uh, uh, occasion to build on this, uh, on this link. So uh, my question for you is, uh, what are the several fairy designs uh, uh, that, uh, and the codes related to that that for you are uh, still connected to the North American culture and are still contemporary in what uh, we consider the actual uh, fashion culture and the American market? Very good question. <laughs> um, hello to everyone. Hello. Um, buonasera a tutti. Prima di tutto, voglio ringraziare, ringraziare l'Istituto uh, Italiano di Cultura di Los Angeles per averci invitato a questo panel e uh, esposizione. So, grazie, grazie mille. <laughs> That's it for me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I remember our, our, first, our Zoom that we had, and, you know, when we found out we were, you know, uh, honored to be invited to speak uh, uh, about Gianfranco Ferre. And um, it took me back, um, and I just uh, talk about a full circle moment, as Emanuele well said, and I, I, I told everybody that it, it took me back to, and I'm going to age myself, but um, when I was a, a fashion student at FIDM, before I, I went to UCLA, actually, just down the block, and studied political science. I wanted to be a diplomat, honorable consul general. And, um, but uh, instead I did a lot of couture gowns during my poli-sci classes. <laughs> and so my fellow students would always nudge me and be like, what are you doing? You know, I would be in a class about the internal struggle of Eritrea and Ethiopia, you know, and I would be doing couture gowns, so, you know. I followed my dream. Anyway, um, I, it, it, you know, when I found out it was Gianfranco Ferri, it took me back to, as a uh, uh, studying fashion, that I would always run, I couldn't wait to go to the international newsstand in Hollywood to pick up the latest Vogue Italia and Hola Alta Moda, <laughs> and they were very expensive, especially for a student, um, to just take a look at the gorgeous, gorgeous uh, photos and the alta moda, the clothing, and in particularly, one of the designers that grabbed me was Gianfranco Ferre, uh, because of uh, it, it. Just it as you, we've all been talking about how emotional his designs are and the study of his designs. And to me, I mean, yes, I'm a I'm a, a fashion lover, so I get very emotional, but I don't get emotional over hoodies, but I do get emotional when I look at. <laughs> Um, Gianfranco Ferre's designs, for sure. And I think in, in, in terms of coming back to the relevance of his codes, the house codes, um, especially with Southern California, as you know, here we are as co-chairs of FIDM in Los Angeles, Southern California, and so bringing it back to LA and the importance. And um, I talk about how Gianfranco Ferre, when you look at some of his uh, you know, early work, late 80s, early 90s, um, maybe late 70s as well, he was doing streetwear, right? I mean, take a look. Um, it's, it's luxe streetwear. And to me, it's, it's so relevant now. And at the time, I mean, of course, it was, it was just, you know, perfection in terms of that luxe streetwear using the luxurious Italian fabrics and the fabulous Italian styling. I mean, you know. I remember, as, uh, again, in you know, my college years, going to Rome, just like, God, every guy looks amazing. <laughs> like, even the garbage man is styled, <laughs> right? Like the way he wraps his scarf. And to me, it's that, that sort of innate um, fabulousness and, and art of, of fashion that I think Gianfranco Ferre, and the, 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 especially with the streetwear, when you look at the mixing of this luxurious wool jacket blazer, but then you see the sneakers, and you see the slacks, and you see the comfortability, um, that's why I call it Lux Streetwear. And because we are in Southern California, Los Angeles, uh, you know, sort of a lot of people would, you know, arguably say is where streetwear started, um, you know, and the mixing of the high and the low. And so when you look at these photos, which again are, you know, some would consider vintage Ferre, um, it's actually very on trend now and very on trend to, 
you know, I know what, what our students want to do at FIDM and, and um, with streetwear and mixing that high low, you know, the mixing of the sneakers with a $3,000 wool jacket, you know? And I think, again, that's something that code that you saw that, that in, I think that's also commonality. That's also why I think the American market really took to Gianfranco Ferre because, you know, we are a sportswear nation. Uh, you know, we're not really an alta moda nation. Um, and so that's, I think, especially with, especially in the 80s when the money was coming in and everybody was living in a high life, I think, of course, when you thought of it Italy, you thought of luxury, and especially with Italian fashion, aspirational, right? Aspirational, right? And aspirational, exactly. Yeah, like aspirational. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's something that I think um, that Americans in the American market took to Gianfranco Ferre, particularly, and of course Armani, but uh, in that it, it was something aspirational. It, it, it made you feel rich, but not tacky rich, right? It, it wasn't like that, it was just elegant rich, but then kind of sporty. So, you know, you could get on your Vespa, right? But still look fabulous. I think that that's one. Um, yeah, let's see, next slide. And to me, you see some of the streetwear influences. Again, this is, you know, uh, early 80s, Gianfranco Ferre with Naomi Campbell in the leather, but the combination of those looks, and then you see the sort of the denim, and these were some of, uh, like, early 2000s, late 90s collections from Gianfranco Ferre while he was still alive. And you see that, that, that he knew, he had that innate sense of mixing that, that sort of sportswear, uh, that high-low, making it look street, but it was high and street. And I think that that's something, again, that um, now, how many, 30 years later, you know, almost 40 years later, that the designers are all doing. You know, look at Pierpaolo Piccioli for Valentino. I mean, it's like, that's exactly what he's doing. And, um, uh, and I think it, it really originated here with uh, Gianfranco Ferre. Um, also structure, I think something like this as well. Uh, I wanted to point out that this is also something that um, American, the American public, and I know particular to our students at FIDM, the drape, the structure, and that, that sense of, of, of the, the architecture, modernity, and turning it into something you know more, I think, m Americans, we look more to the future as opposed to the past, and you see that in Gianfranco Ferrer's design, and I think that's a commonality, especially, again, with the question and the topic, bringing it in, where um, it, it wasn't about, you know, going back to the Renaissance or, you know, some other time period, previous time period. It was, you, you could always see looking to the future, right, with his designs, and I think that that's a commonality that I think Americans, whether they knew it or not, that's sort of, they connected with that that it wasn't so period-like, per se. And you see that with some of these designs. And then I think, finally, I wanted to talk about, uh, which I also loved, is th how the, 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 he was on to cultural diversity and, cu and cultural inclusivity, and also um, showing that, that inspiration, cultural inspiration, which, of course, I think right now is so, I hate to say this, but so on trend, mm -hmm. but look, I mean, I don't know, I think this is 1980, 1979, I mean, and it's Gianfranco Ferre influenced by Japan, Japonais, the whole Japonais look, um, you know, the eyes and the jackets influenced by the, sa the overt influence from the samurais. Um, and so he was doing that sort of cultural inspiration that now it's all the rage, you know, but taking inspiration from different lands. This is like you see from Japan. Um, and the next slide, uh, I think we have from India, as well as Africa, the Maasai, you see that influence there, and it's it's not it, and it isn't cultural appropriation. He was um, he was sort of lifting it up, but again, I think for us, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for all of the United States of America, <laughs> but at least I know and we know. I'm talking about Southern California, Los Angeles. We are here in Los Angeles, and especially with our fashion design students, we know that that is so much, so much on their mind, um, you know. So those, those things, the streetwear, the uh, structure, architecture influences by the modernity, and then finally, I think, um, you know, definitely that cultural influence. I think that's what, that's, I think that really 
binds us together. I'm sorry for the long answer. Oh, no problem. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I think that you caught a very interesting point, and certainly one aspect about Italian fashion and Gianfranco Ferre himself, uh, in terms of looking at the US, was exactly this. So, in some way, Italian fashion started after. French fashion went onto the stage, so in the beginning we also uh, winkled somehow to French fashion, but then the real vision was looking at the US as the new market and exactly in this sense, looking at new lifestyle, a way of living and also wearing things that was more uh, attentive to uh, new uh, lifestyles and modernity somehow. So I think that what you said is perfectly in line with uh, these uh, recurrent links between Italy and, and the US. So that's uh, the turn of uh, David. Uh, you are, of course, designers, but you have also very important uh, um, role within an educational institution. Uh, and uh, as uh, Emanuele pointed out, uh, Gianfranco Ferre was teaching himself during his career, which is not something very common for fashion designers especially. So uh, what do you think uh, it's really relevant uh, in his lessons about fashion design that still is important for contemporary teaching and learning? Can I say everything? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Basically everything, but I'll, I'll be more specific. If you see the first slide, um, this is what just fascinated me because the first sketch that you see there is a sketch that he did of a belt um, almost just post-graduation. So he was just out of school, I think. You might know even more, Paolo, but it was very... <laughs> She's smiling. <laughs> she, she knows exactly the month, the day, the That's year, the everything. That's the first <laughs> picture you will find also on the catalog, actually. So you're yes. pretty, pretty correct. <laughs> and that is the actual belt that he created. Um, and he did this right after graduation when he was becoming interested in fashion design. Um, and Can you take a lot of orders? <laughs> should, I, should I ask Paola? Paola, did Gianfranco Ferre take a lot of orders for, those, for that belt? <laughs> I think that in the very beginning it was for friends. Yes, for maybe. friends. <laughs> okay. is what free, I was. free orders. Yeah. And, and, and he got a little press for doing things. But what's so fascinating is then on the left, when he was far into his career and his success and had done quite well, it, this is one of his watches that he designed. And to see the through line and, and, the, and the connection between um, that belt and that watch just shows you um, his sort of inherent and, and um, devotion to his design aesthetic. Um, and I think that is certainly what we try and teach at FIDM and I was so encouraged to sort of read about his teaching methods and the way he understood design. And um, I think if you go to the next slide, I'm not sure, well, okay. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was interesting because he said he never thought he was gonna be an architect, but he loved design and knew that design was for him. So he learned, I think, inherently, or he learned quickly that his that design was a language that could he could interpret across many disciplines. So I think that's also why he was so successful in many different arenas. And as you can see, this was one of the couches, he, or pieces of furniture, which was a couch that he designed um, and was a huge success. I can't remember the name of the company, but um, he did quite well. And as we still know, he has a furniture line. But you see the connection between this gorgeous wool coat and this wool, you know, couch with, with, the, with the sort of almost removable cover um, and that connection. And it just shows you that he could take his language and interpret it in any way that he wanted. Um, and, and that's an education, uh, something that we try to, to instill with their students, that, it's, it, that, that design language, that, that, that can be brought into many areas, that you can develop products you know, continuing your, um, your codes, your language, um, you know, who you are. And I think this, just, just this image right here is a great 
slide to show students, like, look, do you, you see the connection, right? Like, it's, it's very obvious, but yet not so obvious. And that's what we try to show our students, um, that you can get inspiration, you can also translate your design language, your design codes into other areas of yeah. design, not just clothing, garments. Yeah, and he stated, he said, you know, the composition in fashion is it starts with the drawing is the first step in design, then comes the material, treatments and processing, technology and research, which he we know he was very involved in, um, innovation of fabrications, um, and then he would bring in color as an intrinsic element of design. Um, and I think that it, if you look at many fashion designers, um, you, you see a lot of cohesion over their years and their careers and their design. And I wouldn't say that Gianfranco Ferre, per se, besides the white shirt as being a staple, he, you will look at Chanel or you will look at many designs and there's almost um, a repetition ad nauseum of their design. What he was able to do was take his design language and interpret it um, based on an inspiration. So like what Nick had shown as far as, you know, the samurai warrior, or the certain cultural elements, he would take those principles, um, which were often based in architecture or line or shape, and he was able to um, interpret that in many different ways. So um, his archives, as you know, are quite extensive in their variety, um, yet all had the same language that he was so good at. And you can see um, if it, what I said about the sketch, uh, and we very much <laughs> teach the quick sketch in, in, in our teaching method, and to to get it on the paper as quickly as you can and, and get those ideas out. And we have an exercise for our advanced fashion design students and um, we make them do a hundred quick sketches, but then the instructors got really, really good and then they're, they're like, no, 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 that's not enough. <laughs> They're like, I'm making them make 200 quick sketches. And of course, you know, there are some, not every fashion designer or even fashion design student can sketch. I don't care. Give me something, <laughs> right? You know, when we have interns or we hire assistants and they're like, you know, I saw this and they start to talk, oh, and it kind of looks like this. So I was like, are you done? <laughs> Put it down on paper. I don't care if it's a stick figure with it. I mean, take a look, how gorgeous is this? And it's not a perfect croquis. This is not a perfection of fashion illustration. But boy, oh boy, does it give it to you, right? It gives me life, it, it makes me shake with emotion, and it really translate what, it translates what it is. I'm also a pattern maker at heart, and so I, for many years, worked with designers who just handed this to me to make. And with that, done and done. You know, and so we try to instill that, as David says, with our students, like, just, just do it and, and, and then have it come to life. And now in this social media age of visuals, you will be shocked, or maybe not so shocked, that fashion illustrations are having a, a renaissance, renaissance, right? <laughs> <that> Absolutely. You? <laughs> like, um, you know, uh, it, 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 it's all over Instagram. You know, I always joke, like on my Instagram, I'll put a picture of myself at my birthday with a cake and I get three likes. And then I, I put fashion illustration and all of a sudden I have 250. What the heck, right? Um, because it's almost, it's almost vintage to see those <laughs> sketches. And I think it's wonderful that, that when you see, and you see the connection obviously here. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and he, he had the ability to draw beautiful technical okay. sketches. There are some in the archives yes. that show the exact construction because he was very much a master at construction. But what's so amazing is his ability to get the design on the paper. And, th and these are just more inspirations. Uh, as you can see, the bark of a tree, the tulips. And um, uh, while one might say these can be common uh, inspirations and things that 
you know, we, we look to as inspirations. It was the way he was able to infuse his design language into those common inspirations and take that uh, title of the architect of fashion design and really bring it to another level. So, um, and we also have a white shirt project. Um, yes, so <laughs> I think he's really influenced uh, the, the, the education. We do as well do in you? the fashion program, yes, absolutely. And, and, and as, as you've stated, it, it's a way to strip away all the artifice, all those sort of um, almost, um, what would you say, habits or, or you know, things, things that you would lean on to, to, to interpret design. But when you're taking away those crutches, those things to hold it up yeah. um, and bring it down to the white shirt, and uh, it's and just stripped down. It really is. And when you see this, the the these white shirts, these blouses. I mean, you look at them. Uh, we had a sneak peek, <laughs> um, and you can't. Again, with this assignment, you can't mess it up. It's all there. You know, it's like those designers that always put a center front seam in the gown. It's basically a middle finger saying, I can do this because it's right there. You cannot make a mistake and you can't make a mistake with a white shirt, with a white blouse. You see that flat felt seam. You see the French seaming, like it's got to be finished, right? And so it really is almost like a skeleton exposed. Um, Right, yeah. I would say. Exactly. Yeah. And I hope that Gianfranco Ferri is smiling down at all these different schools and people that <laughs> are, have stolen <laughs> like his white, white, white shirt, shirt. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that these two elements that you pointed out, drawing and this idea also of reworking on the same icon, uh, really represent uh, this idea that these are way of knowing the world somehow. So drawing is uh, a different way of looking at reality and discovering and unveiling it, uh, which sometimes uh, pictures do not uh, are not able to to do. So I think that that's a very interesting aspect of him. And in the exhibition, uh, uh, the sketches and the drawings play uh, a very important role. So just last round, as we don't want to keep people uh, seated and uh, we want you to enjoy the exhibition. We have spoken a lot about uh, uh, his principles. Just uh, one quick uh, answer, one lesson learned from Gianfranco Ferré that you would preserve for the future of fashion design. Uh, never look at fashion in isolation. Uh, would be the way that I see he drew from so many mediums, from music, from concepts, from uh, cultures, from fashion's own history. And he was able to understand how to interpret inspirations. And I think that's very difficult for, for people, that very beginning of the process, mm -hmm. original interpretation of an inspiration. That was very good. <laughs> Can I say that she stole my, my answer? Um, a couple things. I would say uh, something that I would take from Gianfranco Ferre that you can still talk about is that his designs made you dream. And I know that's sort of esoterical. How do you tell someone design to make me dream? You know? But it's, it can be done. Um, and I think Gianfranco Ferre did that really well. I think that that would be, um, that probably would be, it would be that. How can, if you can take his, his design um, codes and, and, and then make you dream with your design, make you dream that you can have that blouse, that white shirt or that jacket or those pants, make you dream that you are someone you are not. You know, <laughs> by putting on those clothing, I think. And then lastly, to also draw emotion, you know? Um, it's like where a lot of people can argue fashion is obviously, you, you, we need to wear clothes, otherwise we'd all be naked, so we need clothes, right? But it also draws emotion, um, you know? Again, it makes you dream and it draws emotion, and I think if we can inspire the future of fashion, the future of design, to, to still give us that. Those are the successful designers. Those are the successful creatives um, because that continues on and on and on. I'm sure so many 
tried and true uh, fans and devotees and clients of Gianfranco Ferre, they didn't just buy one white shirt of his, you know? They, they collected, um, you know, because it just, it, it just, it, it gave them that emotion. And I'm sure it made me, it made them feel fabulous, you know? Um, so that's, yeah, that's For, my answer. In his very own words, he said, in both situations, moreover, the emotional factor intrinsic to fantasy and sensibility cannot and must not be missing. So those are his words. Without ever forgetting that fashion means also dreaming. Well, so you were you right. <laughs> and I would just connect um, the, how important he understood the, uh, the human form um, because he was able to quickly just take his design but never miss the understanding of the, the human body and the human form and how he became the architect. Of, of that design on the human form, yeah. Wow, <laughs> so I think that you caught perfectly all the elements that really represent uh, Gianfranco Ferre heritage. Uh, so just uh, before I uh, let you enjoy the exhibition, uh, I want to, to tell you which are the lessons, the principles that we imagined that we should uh, uh, use to describe his uh, his work and uh, his heritage, but also use it for uh, uh, developing more uh, about fashion and uh, also leaving uh, relevant messages about it. Uh, so as you will see in the exhibition, it is in fact based on uh, this idea of uh, um, catching the principles that were behind his work. Exactly wor working on that liminal border between rationality and emotion that you also underlined. We this was very important for uh, Gianfranco Ferré. And uh, one very uh, important thing for him was that he was able to somehow bring uh, uh, the emotional part, the artistic inspiration, the creative inspiration into this very rigorous process and methodology. So it was easy somehow to look at his archive and uh, uh, catching those principles that were at the base of this process of, as you said, recombining codes through uh, this uh, uh, pathway along emotion and, and rationality. So the exhibition is organized around six principles uh, which exactly focus on these two dimensions. On one side, his inquiry into the uh, human uh, nature and, uh, and the body, for example, as one element that really informs the way we can imagine to construct, to compose a garment, and then the the structure, the space that you create around the garment and then the movement, which is the way the garment expresses and interact with the body and with the environment. And this was one dimension. On the other side, he was also inquiring the artificial world. So there are three other categories that uh, are uh, expressing the way he was looking at matter, exactly using this word. He never used the word material because he was an inventor of matters, uh, sometimes sourcing from outside the fashion worlds and creating, recreating matters for his uh, uh, garments, as well as the color that was an inner element that would shape the garment, not only a superficial attribute, and also the detail. And sometimes he was encrusting the garments many times sourcing from cultural and artistic inspiration, as you were saying. So uh, from this research, also he started to organize his archive, that is uh, the knowledge reservoir that we sourced also for this exhibition. Uh, and I think these uh, principles are very contemporary today, as uh, uh, somehow we are living a very important transition, which is the digital transition. And this transformation is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, merging somehow the physical and virtual
virtual reality within a new cyber physical dimension where actually the new matter are data and we don't see anymore the border between the physicality and the virtual dimension. We tried to explore a little bit also this aspect in the exhibition and this is the contribution of the research center uh, to uh, the reading of Gianfranco Ferré. So uh, uh, close to each garment and sketches you will find QR codes that will connect you uh, from a small exhibition to a very large narrative that is linked to our archive in Milano. So each garment uh, is uh, also expressed uh, through a uh, larger storytelling that is uh, bringing you to the sketches, uh, the, the technical drawings, uh, the fashion show that uh, were at the time uh, uh, connected to the garment. Uh, so this is uh, the experiment that we did for the first time for this uh, exhibition. So again, uh, I thank you all for coming and uh, I hope that you will uh, uh, enjoy it. Uh, I want to uh, just uh, as a final... So we thought that this uh, uh, video could be a nice tribute to uh, start uh, to let you in the exhibition. I just want to give you the chance for a final remark, if you like, or also to catch some questions from uh, the public or from the Zoom connection, if uh, there uh, is any. I would like to make a remark. Um, I think it's important to realize that for Ferre's decades-long career, Rita was by his side and was really a steward of this archive that is unprecedented in our field, in its thoroughness, in its documentation, and in the care that was given to its long-term stewardship. So often these objects, which remain beautiful in their own right, get separated from the first-hand knowledge that someone like Rita has. And then now, after this time, to ensure the long-term future of it, at the Polytechnic, where Ferre attended school himself. And Paola, I mean, the, what you have done in a year and a half is very impressive. Um, 
for an institution to acquire a very large archive to catalog it, activate it, and get it into the form of an exhibition um, in another city in another country um, with the QR code, with the digital elements which propel you know, our students' mm -hmm. engagements, um, it's to be applauded and we thank you. It's smart and impressive. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for these nice words. Uh, I also have uh, a couple of questions that have been texted to me from Zoom. <laughs> so, um, Juliet asks, did Ferre have any muse? Uh, of course, uh, as uh, all designers, he was inspired by uh, many elements from cultures and also from muse, but if I, if I have to tell about his personal vision about uh, women, he was always referring to uh, the aspect of intelligence and smartness as a key component for a woman to express herself and for beauty. So this inner link between intelligence and emotion and beauty was really part of his vision and I think that in terms of imagining muses, this is very contemporary again, this idea that he was referring not uh, to this uh, uh, superficial, I would say, idea of beauty, but to this idea of uh, inner intelligence. Uh, second question, and uh, maybe you can uh, help me also to answer. Uh, Karine says, I love ethnic clothing, so she's referring to one of the topics you touched. Nowadays, it's widely common to include references to other cultures and backgrounds. How did uh, uh, he, his audience react back then? I think, as we saw just in that one slide with Gianfranco Ferri, by the way, thank you uh, for the question, for the Zoom question. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I, at the time, especially when he was doing a lot of the cultural references, and he did it throughout his career, I think it was very well received, and it was sort of paying homage to that, you know, his love of India, or his love of Japan, um, you know, or Africa, or Maasai, but it wasn't so overt, so obvious, and so that's why that even the term which wasn't really in existence at the time of cultural appropriation, it wasn't like it was an, an exact sari from India, but you saw the drape sari influences, for example, in the beaded cowl draping that you saw in Naomi Campbell or some of the models. So it was like it could be caught from there, but it wasn't so obvious. And again, it wasn't so much like he was stealing from that amazing culture. And I think that that's what Gianfranco Ferrer also did so beautifully. And with those gorgeous samurai-shaped, sharp-shouldered jackets, those bomber leather jackets, and then the model with the Nagel, looking like a Patrick Nagel print, you know, but it's the Japanese eye, and it's so like, you know, I mean, it's like, I just hear Duran Duran playing in the background, right? <laughs> like, uh, you, you could just hear it. But it's like, you see those cultural influences, and I think that people really responded to it. Um, evoked you know, emotion. Oh, hello. <laughs> evoked emotion. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe we have a couple of questions from the public here. There's one over one, there. One in the back, back. Sorry, the mic is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the influence of him being an architect originally and the designs were very hard line in his early work, very structured, very linear, and that influence from the architectural background and how it evolved through his design work as a fashion designer? Absolutely. So uh, a very important aspect of uh, his uh, approach to fashion really belongs to architecture and really to the vocabulary of architecture. Um, many times referring to his own work, uh, Gianfranco Ferre was sourcing from the architectural repertoire and he was speaking about one concept in particular that was composition. He actually graduated with a thesis on composition in architecture. 
And I think that also the exhibition will give you this flavor because we are uh, showing only white shirts. And uh, I think that having a white uh, paper as uh, the white shirts really show how then, starting from the basic compositional principles of the white shirt, then he was able to construct and create uh, several different forms. So what you will see is really a uh, taxonomy of the white shirt in, shirt in the exhibition. And I think it's really clear the reference to uh, his architectural uh, uh, background. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And then I just always found, um, even in the fluid designs, you could see the architectural elements. Be because it, it, he looked at it in such a sophisticated way, such a mature way, that um, uh, oftentimes architecture isn't always clean lines. Absolutely. There are fluid moments in architecture and the way an, architecture, uh, an architect interprets a building. Um, and you see that in his draped pieces too, the architecture in those too. And possibly the understanding of materials yes. as well. Yeah. And how a material is used and what it does. Absolutely, and uh, I really liked what you pointed out. Uh, it's more than buildings, always structural form. He was really creating spaces around the body. So sometimes they could be spaces that would envelop the body. Sometimes they were different volumes, but the approach was, as for architecture, building living spaces for the body. And I think that was uh, a really interesting uh, approach uh, from, uh, from him. I don't know if there are other questions. Anyone? You answer them all. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that uh, we <laughs> kept the public too long. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I hope you will enjoy the exhibition.